pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Leslie Goddard. Leslie is an actress and historian who has been portraying famous women in history for more than 10 years. She has both a bachelor's and a master's degree in theater, and she earned a PhD from Northwestern University. She currently works full time as an historical interpreter and public speaker, and today she will take us back to 1964. We are in the living room of former First Lady Jackie Kennedy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jackie Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you. And I also would like to welcome everyone. And I am so glad I haven't had to keep anyone waiting. It's so hard for me just to get around these days. The crowds outside my house, they are just impossible. Tourists everywhere. They eat lunch on my lawn and throw their sandwich wrappers on the ground. It's like this every day, busloads of tourists going by. Sometimes I can hear the guides and the loudspeakers saying, and this is the home of Jacqueline Kennedy, Caroline, and John John. Ugh. We have become a sort of, well, there ought to be a nicer word for it than freak show, but I don't know what it is. I really am becoming tired of starring in everyone's vacation movies. <laughs> Thus, you see, my dark glasses. <laughs> it might be that all of them are looking at me, but none of them can ever tell who I am looking back at. At least that way I can have some fun with it. To be quite honest with all of you, I hardly know what I'm going to do next. Should I stay in Washington with no privacy and stared at constantly? I know that when my husband died, I always said I was going to stay in the places where Jack and I had lived, but now, oh, I'm not so sure. I hardly know what to do next. Oh, but forgive me. All of you did not come here today to hear about my troubles. My topic today is not the incessant nuisance of the prying public, but rather my experiences as the wife of a US senator and then president. Of course, for that, I hardly know where to begin. My experiences were not at all like those of most first ladies. Very few of them have come into the White House as the mother of two small children. Do you know, I had to hire a press secretary, and I told her, my primary goal is to protect my privacy and my children's, but not to offend the press. I would like to have minimum information be given out with maximum politeness. <laughs> Tell reporters I'll be a wife and mother first, and then first lady. Oh, I still hate that term, first lady. It always sounds to me like some sort of saddle horse. <laughs> but you know, Caroline was affected very young. Caroline spoke her very first words during the 1960 presidential primary. Would you like to know what they were? <clears throat> Goodbye, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, and West Virginia. <laughs> I said to Jack, well, I'm sorry that so few states have primaries. We would have had a daughter with the greatest vocabulary of any two-year-old in the country. <laughs> when we got to the White House, I knew she would have to go to school. And of course, if she were in the newspapers all the time, it would affect her little classmates. They might have treated her differently. So, we set up a nursery school and then a kindergarten right in the White House. The children's parents paid all the expenses for the teachers and the supplies. 
I just wanted to provide as much of a sense of normalcy as I could. <laughs> normalcy. As if that were even possible in the White House. Do you know the First Lady I always felt the most affinity for? Mrs. Harry Truman. Think of it. She brought a daughter to the White House at a most difficult age, but managed to keep her from getting spoiled. She kept her family together despite White House demands. And that's the hardest thing to do. But of course, when you are married to a politician, you really can't not be involved in their politics. <laughs> Even when Jack and I were dating back in 1952, Jack was heavily involved in his Senate campaign against Henry Cabot Lodge. So he was spending most weekends up in Massachusetts. He would call me up from some oyster bar with this great clinking of coins. And I would say, Jack, darling, is that you? I can barely hear you. The movies Wednesday? Well, yes, I'll be here in Washington, but will you? <laughs> How he could switch so rapidly from political campaigning to dating, I will never understand. But this was always one of Jack's great charms. He had this ability to focus and then just shift focus so rapidly. <laughs> My life did change when I met Jack, but not for the reasons most people think. We met in 1951 at a dinner party given by friends of ours who had been shamelessly matchmaking for nearly a year. <laughs> Usually that sort of thing does not work out, but this time it did, so I am grateful. Ah, oh, Jack was different, something special. I remember that my mother used to bring around all these bows for me, but Jack really was different. I was working at the time as a reporter for the Washington Times Herald newspaper. I was their inquiring photography girl. This is not very demanding work, but it got me out. My job was to walk the streets of Washington and ask hard-hitting questions like, um, do you think the rich enjoy life more than the poor do? Or um, do you think that a wife should let her husband think he is smarter than she is? I even interviewed Jack. To him I said, uh, tell me, Congressman Kennedy, can you think of any reason why a contented young bachelor would want to get married? The job was mostly to defy my mother. She had refused me a chance to do an internship at Vogue magazine. Six months in New York, six months in Paris. And I won the contest for that internship, but my mother had other plans for me. My mother was always rather strict with us. She never hesitated to give us the back of her hand when she thought it necessary. Us, that's my sister, Lee and I. Lee was always the pretty one. I guess I was supposed to be the smart one. <laughs> Now, if you see photographs of my family when I was growing up, the gentleman that you probably will see will not be my father. You'll see my stepfather, Hugh Auchincloss. My mother married him when I was 11. Two years after my parents divorced. But I did see a good deal of my father, especially after I went away to boarding school at Miss Porter's. All my Farmington friends loved Daddy. He was the most devastating figure, drippingly handsome. All my friends adored him, and they used to line up to be taken out to eat whenever he came to visit. He would take batches of us out to lunch at the Elm Tree Inn and sit there, drink in hand, while we all ordered steaks. 
and two desserts each. We must have eaten him broke. <laughs> to my mother, school was supposed to lead to marriage. Parties and dances, I attended my fair share, but Newport, where I spent most of my summers growing up, when I was about 19, I did not know what I wanted in life, but I knew I did not want to marry any of the young men that I had grown up with. Not because of them, but because of their lifestyle. Handsome young scions of rich families. Ugh. They bored me in about five minutes. I remember once saying to a young man I had just met, well, I'm amazed. You have your whole life planned out that way? Let me see if I have this right, hmm? Career, marriage, house, dog, country club, children? Tell me, do you have a grave site picked out yet? <laughs> me? No. Only thing that matters to me and a man is that he weigh more and have bigger feet than I do. <laughs> it's size 10, good heavens. To my mother, this was the height of carelessness. Jacqueline, she would say, your choice of a husband is the most important decision you will ever make. Be smart, Jacqueline. Better to be bored with a rich man than bored with a poor one. So you see, when Jack and I were dating, I was not at all sure I even wanted to marry. A cousin of mine asked once, was there any truth to the rumors that Jack and I were serious? And I said to him, well, you know Jack goes to a hairdresser almost every day to have his hair done. And if, when we're at a party or a reception or something, no one recognizes him and no photographers take his picture, he will sulk about it afterwards for hours. <laughs> really? Oh, he's so vain, you can't believe it. And he's ambitious, all right. He even told me that he plans, well, his father plans, he will be president of the United States one day. <laughs> My family had mixed feelings about Jack and his family. The Kennedys, the Kennedys were like carbonated water and all other families are flat. <laughs> He would be talking about so many things with so much enthusiasm or playing games at dinner or in the living room, anywhere, everyone would be talking about something. They even competed with each other in conversation to see who could say the most and talk the loudest. Just watching them wore me out. The one person in my family who adored Jack was my father. My father and Jack hit it off right away. We three had supper shortly before we became engaged. They spent the whole night talking about, what else? Politics, sports, and girls. <laughs> That's what all red-blooded men like to talk about. And then a few days later, Auntie Edie, I want you to know I've become engaged to Jack Kennedy. Yes, but you cannot tell anyone about it for a little while because it wouldn't be fair to the Saturday Evening Post. The Post, they're coming out tomorrow with a story about Jack on the cover. Jack Kennedy, the Senate's gay young bachelor. <laughs> I know. I have taken the choicest bachelor in the Senate. I was hoping for a small, elegant wedding, but the Kennedys would have none of that. We had 26 groomsmen and bridesmaids at our wedding. 900 guests at the mass, 1,200 at the reception. My mother was terrified of Jack because she couldn't push him around at all. I, of course, expected that my father would walk me down the aisle, but 
On the morning of the wedding, he started drinking. My mother refused to even permit him to attend. My stepfather, Uncle Hughie, had to step in and walk me down the aisle. <clears throat> yeah. I would like to thank all of you so much for being here today and sharing this day with us. Do you know, my mother always told me that I should wait and judge a man by the quality of his correspondence. <clears throat> Wish you were here. Cheers, Jack. <laughs> this is my entire correspondence from Jack Kennedy. <laughs> Living with Jack was like, was like being married to a whirlwind. He was indestructible. People who tried to keep up with him dropped like flies, including me. I remember one morning, the very first year we were married, he said to me, what, uh, what are you having for the 40 people who are coming for luncheon today? <gasps> no one had told me anything about it. It was 11 o'clock in the morning and they were expected at one. I was in a panic. Jack was traveling all over the country, giving speeches. He was never home more than two nights in a row. I was alone almost every weekend. It was all wrong. Politics was sort of my enemy as far as our home life was concerned. And my other enemy, well, I went into our marriage with my eyes open. My sister-in-law, Joan, who was married to Jack's brother, Teddy, she had more illusions than I did. I remember once saying to her, Jonesy, I don't think that there are very many husbands who are faithful to their wives. Kennedy men are like that. They'll go after anything in a skirt. <laughs> you have to block it out. Imagine that you are turning the station on a radio when you don't like what's playing. But we worked it out. We made concessions. Jack learned to enjoy fine cuisine more than just his favorite pigs in a blanket. <laughs> I boned up on American history and I learned to golf. Jack began to dress much more fastidiously. He even agreed to go to art galleries and ballets with me. I did sometimes do things to help him in his work. I could translate for him a speech on Indochina because so much of the original source material was in French. My most important role, the best thing I could do for him was to be a distraction. A husband lives and breathes his work all day long. If he comes home to more table thumping, how could the poor man ever relax? So I never did anything or said anything upsetting. And when he came home, I always liked to have his favorite record playing and perhaps a few friends. Oh, and his favorite drink, a daiquiri. I must share with you, this is Jack's favorite daiquiri recipe. I had to tape this up in the kitchen at the White House so the staff would get it right. <laughs> you mix two pots rum with two pots frozen limeade, add one pot fresh lime juice, and a few drops of falernum. The fresh lime juice, that's key. I would have so much preferred to remain like that, behind the scenes, not out in front, always being stared at and analyzed, everything you do, what you wear, what you say. I am so grateful to my parents for the efforts they made to teach us foreign languages. Because the people we met campaigning, who contributed so much to our culture, it always seemed to me only a proper courtesy to address them in their own tongues. <clears throat> Q. 
Queridos amigos, les hablan la esposa del senador John F. Kennedy, candidato a la presidencia de los Estados Unidos. Para el futuro de nuestros niños, votan ustedes para el Partido Democrático. So much of politics is unfair. It always seemed to me so unfair of people to be against Jack merely because he was a Catholic. He was such a poor Catholic. <laughs> If it had been his brother Bobby, I would have understood it more. And all those letters saying I should change my hairstyle to something more fitting for the wife of a presidential candidate. Jack used to say to my secretary, Oh, uh, Mary, how's the mail coming on Jackie's hair? It's amusing, perhaps, but also puzzling. What does my hair do have to do with my husband's ability to be president? I did bar photographers from taking any photographs of me smoking. Well, Jack was such a bear about my cigarettes. I finally had to encourage him to have a cigar after dinner because at least that way he would not complain so much about my cigarettes. It was a bad habit that I picked up at boarding school. I was always trying to imitate the girls who had callers every Saturday night. I passed the finish line up in the balcony of the Normandy Theater in New York by a girl who pressed a cigarette on me and then led me out when an usher came to complain. People could not hear the film with all that coughing going on. <laughs> so no photographs smoking. Then, women's were daily reported that Jack's mother and I each spent $30,000 a year on French clothing. Well, that's just dreadfully unfair. I told them I could not spend that much on clothing, not unless I wore sable underwear. <laughs> I'm sure I spent less than Mrs. Nixon did on clothing. <laughs> But I have to dress well, Jack, so I don't embarrass you. As a public figure, you would be humiliated if your wife were photographed in some saggy old house dress. Everyone would say your wife is a slob and refuse to vote for you. <laughs> Of course, for most of that campaign, well, I knew I was expecting another baby. And I would not be able to play much part. I thought I should be with Jack, and if it hadn't been for the baby, I would have campaigned vigorously. I can't be so presumptuous as to think I would have had any impact, but it would have been tragic. If Jack had lost by a few votes merely because I was not at his side, and people had met Mrs. Nixon and liked her, of course, at least it got me out of those dreadful chicken dinners. Ugh. Oh, you know, sitting at a head table where you couldn't have a cigarette, having to wear a silly corsage, and listen to some old windbag, ugh. It drove me up the wall. Poor Jack. <laughs> But all his hard work paid off in November. His deepest wish, well, his father's deepest wish come true. The 35th president of the United States. I heard Jack's inaugural address in little bits and pieces many times when he was working on it at the Kennedy Winter Home in Palm Beach. There were piles of yellow paper covered with his notes all over a bedroom floor. But when I heard it, that day in Washington as a whole for the first time, 
It was so pure and beautiful and soaring. I knew that I was hearing something great. I knew it would go down in history. It was one of the greatest speeches ever given. Do you remember? Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Ah. There was so much I wanted to say to him, but I could hardly have embraced him in front of all those people. So I just said to him, Jack, you were wonderful. And he was smiling in the most touching and the most vulnerable way. His family was walking on air, but to me, it was all terrifying. It really is frightening to lose all your anonymity at age 31. We had to begin giving parties and receptions and we traveled a great deal, Jack and I. Fortunately, Jack never required much more from me than perhaps to give a short speech or two. <clears throat> I know that we share the desire of bringing to all the people of this hemisphere a better life for themselves and their children. And I know you will agree with me, the good things in life, education and housing, employment, should be within the reach of all people and not just a few. Blessed by fortune. Oh, I never envied Jack the difficult tasks. In Vienna, such a difficult summit. Jack always compared the Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev, to his father. <laughs> always expecting all give, no take. There was very little I could do for them except well, perhaps I could help the Khrushchevs feel more comfortable. I remember one afternoon at tea, the crowds outside the windows started calling out, Jackie, Jackie. So I asked Mrs. Khrushchev to come to the window with me and we waved to the crowds together. And soon they were calling out, Jackie, Nina, Jackie, Nina. Small contribution to international diplomacy, but something I could do. When I visited India and Pakistan, it was without Jack. I had no desire to be a public figure on my own. And the international press, you know, criticized me on that trip for wearing high fashion in a country so overrun with poverty. I finally had to tell my press attaché, do not release any more fashion information. I know that I am more of fashion interest than other first ladies, but really, I don't want to be plagued by any more fashion stories of a sensational nature. I don't want to be the Marie Antoinette of the 1960s. I'm glad I went, but I vowed never to do another trip like that again. Jack was always so proud of me when I did something like that. But really, I can't stand being out in front. I know that this will sound trite, but what I really wanted was to be behind Jack and to be a good wife and mother. What I wanted to do most was to make the White House the most perfect house in America. That mansion is so much more than just the official center of the executive branch and a place to entertain. It should be a show place of a great heritage and an inspiration to all Americans. But when Mrs. Eisenhower showed me around for the very first time, all I could think was, Oh, God. 
It's the worst place in the world. It was so cold and dreary. It looked like it had been furnished by a discount furniture store <laughs> during a January clearance. When the windows did not open, when we tried to use the fireplaces, they smoked because they had not been used in so long. And so little about history. There were all these people coming to see the White House. They saw almost nothing that dated to before 1948. Well, I knew I'd feel terribly if I lived in that house four years and had not done anything for those rooms. Jack had to be convinced of the worthiness of this project. So we set up a fine arts committee. We hired a curator. We went through all 54 rooms of the White House looking for forgotten historical treasures. I felt so strongly. The White House should have as fine a collection of American paintings as possible. It's so important. The setting in which the presidency is presented to the world, to foreign dignitaries, and the American people should be proud of it. We've had a great history, but so many Americans don't realize it. You know, Walter Annenberg, the great newspaper and magazine publisher, he had a portrait of Benjamin Franklin that I knew would be perfect for the White House. So I called him up. I told him all about our plans to make the White House a national monument. I said to him, Mr. Annenberg, I have heard you have a magnificent portrait of Benjamin Franklin. And of course, that's why I thought of you. Mr. Annenberg, you are the first citizen of Philadelphia. And in his day, Ben Franklin was the first citizen of Philadelphia. Do you think that one great Philadelphia resident would give the White House a portrait of another great Philadelphia resident? And do you know, even though that painting had cost him more than $250,000, he gave it. Oh, we relied on donations like that and the proceeds from a booklet we put together all about the White House. Aside from the obvious benefit of having an authoritative book and something children could bring home, I knew it would eventually be a source of revenue for us. So we would not have to beg and borrow for each item desired. So many things slipped through our hands because we could not raise the money. At one point I said to Jack, you always balk at spending a few thousand dollars on a lovely picture. But I think you would spend any amount of money if it could buy you votes. <laughs> Eventually he did come around. It was Jack who decided we ought to have a television program about it in the White House. Nervous? Absolutely. I think I only got through that taping with the help of Marlboroughs <laughs> and several strong scotches. The program aired on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1962, simultaneously on CBS and NBC, and then the following Sunday on ABC. I have been told 48 million Americans watched it. That's three out of four of every American who owned a television. I was not one of them. But I am glad for the visibility that it gave to our work. I just thought everything in the White House should be the best. The entertainment that was given there. If it was an American company you could help, I like to do that. My husband and I shared a belief that the artist should be honored by society. The arts have always been treated as a poor stepchild in this country. 
Our great museums and performing companies, of course, should be supported. And you know Jack tried so hard. When we succeeded in bringing the great cellist Pablo Casals to the White House, I had to station my social secretary, Letitia Baldridge, behind a doorway directly in Jack's line of view. That way she could signal to him when the music was really finished. <laughs> Otherwise, there was always the danger that Jack would leap up at any slight pause in the music and start shaking the artist's hand. <laughs> I had so much hope to someday have a minister for the arts in the cabinet, as they do in France. Meeting the French minister of culture was one of the highlights of my years in the White House. I said to him, Monsieur Mauro, it is such a pleasure to meet you. I have such an affinity for your country. Do you know both of my grandparents were French? What's that? Yours were too? <laughs> Monsieur Moreau, I have been thinking about something you said. You said that art, that public places with sculpture can affect someone as they're rushing off to work, perhaps change their opinion of themselves. Oh, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Family, though, that's most important. Whatever work I did, I never let it interfere with our family life. Jack and I both wanted a large family. When we found out last spring that I was expecting again, we were both ecstatic. But when Patrick was born, he only lived three days. He was five weeks early, you know, and he was so tiny. And Jack was inconsolable. Shocking as it was for me, I think it was even worse for him. He nearly collapsed over it. And I was so melancholy after Patrick's death. I went away on vacation and perhaps stayed away longer than I should have. And perhaps I was a bit snappish when I got back. I could have made his life so much better those last few weeks. I could have tried harder to get over my melancholy. I could have kept him from going to Texas. It was a political fence-mending trip, starting the campaign for 1964. All that he said to me was, I'd, uh, I'd love you to go with me, but only if you want to go. You could be a great help to me, but if you don't want to go, I will understand. So I went with him to Texas, even though I knew that I would hate every minute of it, but Jack wanted me there, and it seemed like a small sacrifice to make on my part. And certainly, I did have a feeling it was going well. There were such big crowds of such wavy, nice, happy people, wonderful assemblies with warm welcomes. Three times we were greeted with the yellow roses of Texas. <laughs> Only when we got to Dallas, they gave me red roses. I remember thinking, how funny to be given red roses when you're in Texas. <laughs> when we got to Dallas, there was the biggest motorcade from the airport. And when we were all in the car and the motorcade was ready to begin, one of Jack's assistants came running up to me and he said to me, now you make sure to look to your left, away from the president. You wave at the people on your side. If you both wave at the same voter, it's just a waste. So in that motorcade, I usually was looking mostly to the left, and he was looking mostly to the right, which is one reason we were not looking at each other very often. And it was terribly hot, just blinding all of us. 
And at one point, Mrs. Connolly, the governor's wife who was sitting in front of me, she turned around and she said, well, Mr. President, you certainly can't say Dallas doesn't love you. And he said, no, you can't, or something like that. And she said, we'll be there soon. Now, in a motorcade, there is always noise. And there are motorcycles by you, a lot of them backfiring. There was a noise, but it didn't seem to me like any different sort of noise because there always is noise, motorcycles and things. I was looking to the left, but suddenly out of the corner of my eye, I could see Governor Connolly suddenly sit up and say, oh no, no, no. And so I turned to the right. All I remember is my husband. He had this sort of puzzled look on his face and his hands were up. I remember thinking he looked just as if he had a slight headache. I just remember that, no blood or anything. And then he raised his hands and fell into my lap. And then I just remember being down in the car. I, I know there were photographs of me climbing out the back. I don't remember that at all. I just remember being down in the car and there was so much confusion. And it seemed like an eternity, that ride to the hospital. And when we got to the hospital, they tried to take me away. They tried to grab me, but I kept saying, I am not going to leave him. I'm not going to leave him. I am not going to leave him. I remember this long corridor. This big policeman brought me a chair, and so I sat there and I watched them going in with saline solutions and other things. And for a minute, I thought to myself, maybe he's not gone. Maybe he's still alive. I saw them going in, and I thought, maybe he's still alive. I knew he was gone. And then I saw a doctor coming towards me and he said to me, Mrs. Kennedy, you need a sedative. And I said to him, I want to be with him when he goes. And this doctor forced his way in. He just kept saying, it's her prerogative, it's her prerogative. So I finally got in. There must have been 40 people in that tiny little operating room. There was already a sheet over Jack, but his foot was sticking out of the sheet. So I took his foot and I kissed it. And then someone found his hand under the sheet and I held on to it all the time that the priest was saying the extreme unction. And all that I could think of was, if only I had been looking to the right, I would have seen the first shot hit him and I could have pulled him down. But I was looking to the left. Well, there's one Last thing I'd like to say. I'm actually really rather ashamed of myself. Jack, every time Jack ever quoted anything, it was always Greek or Roman, and yet one thing keeps going through my head. This line from a musical comedy. I said to Bobby, I have to talk to somebody. I have to see somebody. This line from a musical comedy has become almost an obsession with me. At night, before going to bed, we had this old Victrola. We'd play a couple of records. I'd get out of bed at night when it was so cold. And there was this song that he loved at the end. He loved <clears throat> Camelot. It's the last song on the last side of the record. Ask every person if he's heard the story. 
and tell it loud and clear if he has not. How once there was a spot for one brief shining moment. It will never be that way again. I know there will be other great presidents, and the Johnsons really have been wonderful to me, but there'll never be another Camelot. Jack loved history so much. History made Jack what he was. This sick little boy, he sat and read history. He had scarlet fever, this little boy who was sick so much. All the time that he was sick in bed as a little boy, he was reading history. He was reading Marlborough or the Knights of the Round Table and he just loved that song. So then I thought, well, maybe if history made Jack see heroes, then perhaps others also? Ah, history. I will tell all of you one thing. When this is all finally over, I am going to crawl into the deepest retirement there is. I am not going to be one of those people who goes around talking about themselves. I don't want to go out on a Kennedy drive to go to a Kennedy airport to visit a Kennedy school. I don't want medals for Jack. I do not want to be seen by crowds. I have everything that I want. I have that flame at Arlington Cemetery. You know, sometimes at night you come over the hill and there's that big Lee Mansion all lit up. It's one of the first things Caroline ever recognized. I care about that flame. And Caroline, do you know, all through the funeral services, she held onto my hand like a trooper. She's my helper. She's mine now. John, well, John makes friends with everyone immediately. He surprises me in so many ways. I would like John to grow up to be a good boy. I have no better wish for him. I would like John to be a fine young man. So do you know I think I've known the answer to my question all along. My question earlier about what to do next, there's really only one thing I can do, isn't there? Save my children. They have to grow up without thinking back at their father's murder all the time. They have to grow up intelligently, attuned to life in a very important way, moving, to New York with John and Caroline, that will be good for me and stop me brooding all the time. That is how I wish to live the rest of my life. Oh, I cannot thank all of you enough for being here today and listening to me. Perhaps together, all of us, perhaps we can help others like those crowds outside my house to understand that we are all human. Even though a person may be very well known, they still hold in their hearts the emotions of any other person. For those moments that are the most important we will know in life, for marriage and death and birth and so. I do remain Mrs. John F. Kennedy. Thank you all so much for listening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Shall we open it up for questions? Any questions, anything that came to mind or anything you've always wanted to ask Mrs. Kennedy? This is your chance. <laughs> what can I tell you? Yes? What happened to the suit? That ah, what happened to the suit? Well, let me say one important thing about the suit. 
when we were back on Air Force One, and to go back to Washington afterwards, Mrs. Johnson very kindly came in and she asked if she could help me change into something. And I said to her, no, because I want them to see what they've done to Jack. I wore that suit all the way back to Washington and back to the White House. After that, I boxed it up and gave it to my mother, and she held on to it for a little while, and now she gave it to the National Archives, and they have it in a, in a room where I know it'll be preserved for future generations. I don't want it shown in the lifetime of anyone who was alive then, but perhaps someday when we have a little more perspective on it, perhaps then we can take it out and, and share with others such an awful, awful day. But let me do this, if you don't mind. I'm going to take off my gloves, and perhaps I will um, take off my hair, <laughs> if I can do this. Uh, so you'll know, I'm going to go back. Jackie actually did sometimes wear a, a wig, so that's my excuse. But I want to go back to being Leslie Goddard. Is there anything I can tell you? As, as Leslie about um, the process, yeah. So Leslie, what got you into this to do performances? I know, what got me into this? Well, <laughs> yeah. Obviously you're taking on roles of historic. Yeah, exactly. Um, I got into it, you know, everyone I know who does historical portrayals gets into it in a different kind of a way. In my case, I, you know, I studied theater in, from high school all the way through college, but I really loved history, and I always wanted to work in history museums. So that's really the first career path I went on, but someone found out that I had a theater background, and they asked me to do a portrayal of a local woman. This was in uh, Evanston. So I did a portrayal, and I thought, what a fascinating way to think about history and to tell historical stories. So I just started doing portrayals of women in history I thought were interesting. And it grew pretty steadily. This was about 15 years ago. And um, about 10 years ago, I got busy enough that I started doing, I do portrayals and lectures full time. So I do portrayals of about eight or nine women and they're all really different. Um, just last night I was doing Lizzie Borden. Um, I do, uh, this afternoon I was doing Rachel Carson, the environmentalist. I do Amelia Earhart. I do Louisa May Alcott. I do Eleanor Roosevelt. How's that for a different first lady? Uh, so it's a pretty wide range of different women, but uh, it speaks to my interest in both history and theater. So how lucky am I to do this? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Kennedy, how much research did you have to do with uh, Because I just read the book on it. Did you? Yeah. I knew she smoked, but she didn't want in. Right, there. right. She was asking uh, how much research did I have to do. I had to do a lot. Yeah. And you know, every character I do is completely different because I try to read secondary sources. I try to read first person, you know, if they have a diary or did they write a book. Jackie Kennedy was a real challenge um, for two big reasons. Number one, she never wrote an autobiography. She was very private. She never wrote, I mean, she certainly never, um, never even really gave a lot of interviews. She was very, very private. So it was a challenge. And, and number two, there's a lot of myths and legends about her and sifting out, you know, the reality from what are kind of, you know, scandalous stories that we all love, you know, gossip. And by the way, Jackie loved gossip. She was always buying, you know, tabloid magazines, which is so funny. Um, what I tried to do as much as I could, I tried to read our interviews, articles, and books by people who knew her. Um, good friends of hers, people who worked with her. Letitia Baldridge, for example, wrote a great book about her time in the White House. And I also tried to read as many books as I could by historians who I felt were really good at distinguishing. You know, Kitty Kelly, I didn't find to be terribly reliable. Um, but, you know, someone like Barbara Leeming, who wrote um, Jackie Bouvier, Kennedy Onassis, um, 
Um, the book Grace and Power I thought was particularly well done. Things like that. So it was, it was, a, it was a challenge. Sometimes I got fortunate, and you do get Jackie's own words, but it's rare. For example, the story of the assassination, she almost never talked about it. But she did talk about it for the Warren Commission. So I relied on her testimony for the, the Warren Commission being the one that studied the assassination. So as much as I could, I tried to rely on that. And if not, as close to the source as I could get. This is in contrast to Eleanor Roosevelt, who like wrote 27 books and 6,000 articles. And it's like, oh my god, it's an overabundance of riches. Yeah. What were some of the things that she was able to do to keep her kids private? Uh, what were some of the things she did to keep her kids private? You know, I have so much respect for her as a mother. Let me give, see if I can give you a couple of good examples. Um, when the assassination happened, the White House was flooded with gifts from the American people for John and Caroline. And what Jackie did is, she, you know, they had them organized in the White House, and she took Caroline and John down there and talked to them about what this, you know, what the people who sent these things were feeling. And then she allowed Caroline and John each to pick out one present. And then they agreed that all the rest of them would go as donations to needy children. Um, another time, and this is after they had moved to New York, apparently John F. Kennedy Jr., when he was you know, probably a preteen, he went to a bank and he didn't feel like waiting in line. So he announced to everybody in the line that he was John F. Kennedy's son. And they all let him go to the front of the line. And when he went home and told Jackie that, she was infuriated. She went back with him to the bank and made him personally apologize to all the people who worked at the bank for that. So those, are, I think, are just two really good examples of the kind of a mother that she wanted to be. And she took them. I mean, they were in Central Park all the time. They were, um, even though the paparazzi hounded them, she really tried to make them have as normal a life as they could. She also kind of limited the time that they spent with their cousins. <laughs> she wanted them to, to know the Kennedys and to have a good relationship with their Kennedys' um, cousins, but she was a little worried about. What was her relationship with the Kennedys? What was her relationship? Uh, complex in a lot of ways. Um, I, you know, she, in many ways, in many ways, she was very close. I mean, she and Bobby had a very close relationship. I am not convinced they ever had an affair. But I do think they were extremely close. They both really lost the most at the moment of the assassination. Um, she was also very close to Joe Kennedy. By all accounts, when Joe Kennedy, uh, JFK's father, had a stroke, um, Jackie was remarkably relaxed with him, teasing him, very comfortable, very good at bringing him out. Um, she was less close to Rose Kennedy, which I find fascinating because they were so similar in so many ways. I mean, they both loved shopping for clothes. They both had to deal with unfaithful husbands. But they were never very close. Um, maybe they were you know, too common or something. She was very good at. Um, you know, the, the, the Kennedys were so lively, and even the, the girls in that family were, you know, playing football and running around. And Jackie was not, that just wasn't who she was. And she was really good at saying, you know, be yourself. You know, why worry about if you don't like playing football, um, do what you want to do. She knew herself remarkably well. I'm always impressed by her that way. She did, by the way, um, very much support Bobby Kennedy. She held off on announcing her engagement to, you might have heard she married Aristotle Onassis in 1968. She held off announcing that until Bobby Kennedy, um, uh, well, until he was in the running for president. Um, she also very much supported Teddy Kennedy when he was running for president. So she did, you know, use her celebrity to support the other Kennedys very much. How old was she when she died? How old was she when she died? Let's see, she was born in 1929. She passed away in 1994. So who's really good at math? 65, yeah, I can't, I'm trying to remember if it was 64 or 65, but uh, it was, 
It was in her mid-60s. Isn't that sad to think about? Yeah, she was. It was, it was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that she developed. She lived long enough to, to meet all of Caroline's children, but of course, she didn't live to see them grow up. They are all now in their, but they're in their late 20s, early 30s now, Caroline's children. And they're, of course, gorgeous. They're just beautiful people. <laughs> Can you imagine, you know, having Jackie and John Kennedy as your grandparents? Did their children go into politics then? Have they gone into politics? No. Um, although, you know, I will say Caroline Kennedy has done a really good job of keeping her children sort of out of the private, uh, out, out of the public eye. She has only recently, in the last five years or so, um, brought them in more, like for activities at the Kennedy Library. The children now participate in the Profiles in Courage Awards and things like that. But um, she was very much her mother's daughter in keeping her private life private. Yeah. Yeah. Did she have any difficulties with the uh, Catholic Church on her and Ah, did she have any difficulties with the Catholic Church? Yes, she absolutely did. And when they married, it was in the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, it, although, interestingly, it was less of a challenge, I think, than it was with the American public, because the American public was really incensed that she would um, you know, give up her legendary status. And what she always said, and I think this is such a good index of who she was, Someone said to her, but you know, you're gonna fall off the pedestal that people have put you on. And she said, I don't wanna be a, on a pedestal. I want to be a human being. And I think she felt that way about um, uh, religion as well. She was, she was by all accounts a very religious person, but not to the point that it would uh, impact who she was as a human being, if that, if that makes sense. Um, just to give you the rest of the story, if you don't remember, um, after Aristotle Onassis died in 1975, and there's a lot of indication they would have divorced, but they didn't, he passed away. She then, and she never needed to work again, but she did. She went back to work as a book editor, first with Viking Press and then with Doubleday. Um, edited quite a number of really wonderful books. Um, Margot Fontaine's biography, a book about Russian design, things like that. Uh, and she, was, she continued to work right up to the time when she passed in 1994. John F. Kennedy Jr., you might remember, died in 1999. He did not start flying until after she had passed away. Caroline Kennedy is still alive. She served as ambassador to Japan um, in the Obama years. Um, so there is the legacy and it still goes on. There are still, and this is the last point I'll make, there are some papers of Jackie Kennedy's that are still sealed. Some of them not intended to be unsealed until what? I wanna say 2042, something like that. We will probably all be gone before they're unsealed, if, unless science changes. What they will reveal or not, we don't know. Some historians say probably it won't be anything earth shattering we don't already know. But some people say you never know. Jackie was a woman who was um, very private, so who knows. Is Carolyn's husband still alive? I know they yes, yes, he is still alive. There was, you know, she never took his last name, so there's always been that rumor was Caroline's marriage, you know, okay? And there are some people who feel that there might have been some strains in it. Honestly, I don't know. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Schlossberg is his last name. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one last question. You did such a wonderful job. I just want to thank you. Oh, yes. Nice. You're not referring to anything. Oh, I just somebody else this afternoon. How do you do this? Oh, thanks. I know. I know. You know, well, it's one reason that I, she was saying, you know, how do I keep this all in my mind? It's one of the things that's good about keeping it to just, you know, eight or nine women are about as many as can live in my brain at any one time. So once in a while, I'll add in a new character and then I have to rotate someone off, which is, you know, like <laughs> getting rid of a child. So um, it is limited. Yeah. I just have to tell you the first time I ever saw you. You did a media earmark. Oh, yes. Ever since then, 
All I do is read about real life. Oh, yeah, that's nice. nice. I, you, too, you do a lot of research. A yeah. lot of research. Oh, oh well, thanks. Thank you many times. In Hinsdale, I went to their library. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I follow you. That's nice of you. Well, thanks. Well, I say it right back to everybody because uh, I'm fortunate to do this. Well, thanks. That's great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Good night.